Welcome back to Driver Suit Blog Radio. As always, I'm your host, David G. Firestone, and today we're going to be doing a news and notes thing. I've been working on something Driver Suit related, but I've had trouble with the research. But it's coming soon, I promise. We're going to do some news and notes today, because there were a few stories this last week that I um, wanted to talk about. One of them I had to cancel because I couldn't find any corroborating evidence from other sites, but that's neither here nor there. And uh, we do have a issue with the dog who's it's going through some separation anxiety because the rest of the family's out today. So if you hear squeaking, that's what it is. So let's get to the news. Now the first one, the first two stories happened during the um, when I did the uh, paint scheme reviews for the throwback race instead of the typical um, podcast. I don't know why I forgot about that. I should have remembered it. I'm sorry. But the first one was uh, uh, concerning track house racing, wanting to do something for the throwback race at Darlington that I actually was really on board with. But they were they had purchased um, Harry Gant's 1991 Skull Bandit which had won every race in the month of September, a feat that, to the best of my knowledge, I don't know if there's been any car that's won four races in a single month other than that. Well, Trackhouse Racing owner Justin Marks purchased the car, and they had planned to put the car on the Darlington track for ceremonial laps prior to to the uh, race on Sunday. In a tweet announcing this decision, Marks tweeted that, quote, it's important for to Team Trackhouse to be good stewards of the history of NASCAR. To that end, we purchased this car from Andy Petrie. It is, in fact, the car that Harry Gant won every race in September 1991, and I'm going to make pre-race laps in it Sunday at Too Tough to Tape. Now, this car has been on display at the Trackhouse Racing Shop for a while, but it had been prepped to be driven on track Sunday. On Friday, Marks tweeted that this plan was canceled because of tobacco advertising restrictions. Quote, Bad news, folks. Due to federal laws that prevent tobacco branding slash advertising in professional sporting events, the school bandit will not make laps at Darlington Speedway. Pretty gutted, dot, dot, dot. This was later followed up with. Quote, Looked at a lot of options here late in the game to change the livery. Need to respect those that would allow it to happen. I will say this. At some point this year, I will give you all something awesome to watch with this car. And I like what he tried to do, but the tobacco laws are the law, and sometimes the law is unfair. I also think that if Skull had gone out of business, this might not be an issue, but with a company running well, the law is the law. I think it sucks, but it is what it is. And now to another story I talked about a few weeks ago, specifically episode 17 on April 29th. You know, I hate it when I'm right. I hate it when I'm right. But I was right in this particular sense. On Monday, May 2nd, the NFL announced that after a 60-day review, independent investigators led by former Security Exchange Commissioner Chair Mary Jo White, quote, determined that None of the allegations could be substantiated, and there was no evidence to substantiate any of the allegations made by former Cleveland Browns head coach Hugh Jackson that the team intentionally lost games in 2016 and 2017. Also of note was the fact that Jackson initially agreed to meet with the investigators, but this ended up not happening. The investigation also had access to public statements, filings, that he that he had previously made, and his testimony in a pl- in a prior arbitration hearing. Brown's former Jimmy Hasselam was also interviewed, and also interviewed were current and former members of the Browns. In addition to this, the Browns also supplied numerous documents to help the investigation. The Browns re- the Browns released a statement shortly after the release, stating that quote. We appreciate the independent investigation led by Mary Jo White and the Debezois, I hope that's how you pronounce it, team, which brings to a closure these allegations 
that were that Hugh Jackson publicly recanted shortly after they made that we've known all along are categorically false. As we previously stated, we welcome this investigation because the integrity of our game is something that should not be taken lightly, and an independent review has was crucial in bringing a conclusion to this matter. Well, I hate it when I'm right, but also, anyone really shocked here? I mean, seriously, is there anyone here who's really shocked with this outcome? Did anyone not see this coming? Like I said, I predicted all of this during episode 17 on April 29th. Literally every one of my predictions came true. There was no evidence, none of the allegations could be substantiated, and the whole thing was one big joke. This was again try, uh, just a guy who couldn't cut the mustard and who got fired for not doing well, and then he turns around and tries to extort money or something out of his former employer. Guess what? It's Murray Hodgson. Again, Murray Hodgson was an uh, ring announcer for WWE, or excuse me, a television announcer for WWE in 1992, couldn't cut the mustard, got fired, heard some allegations being made, and then he tried to extort money, and it failed. That's all this was. He's He was bitter that he didn't get his way, and he, you know, he tried to cover up his incompetence by placing blame elsewhere. It didn't work. And, and you know what? I like the way this ended. I'm happy it ended the way it did. And I don't feel bad at all for what happened. He tried to, he messed with the bull, he got the horns, and he's probably never going to be a coach in the NFL again. Because what team would hire somebody who's going to, who's not only beyond incompetent, but will will complain about lies? Bit of a thunder. I hope that's not a thunderstorm. But what 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 team would hire somebody who's not only incompetent but would make up accusations like this at the drop of a hat to justify his incompetence? No one. He's gonna be. He, he should just stick to college ball. And that's all there is to it. Now I'm going to take a quick break. And I've been wanting to do this story for a while. But it's been covered by other people, but I want to put my take on it. So we're going to talk about L.W. Wright next. I'll be right back. So I am back, and I've been wanting to do L.W. Wright's story for quite a while now. But when I started working on this, there were some developments that were taking place that made me decide to push this back a bit because these updates might actually shed some light on the story. And as it turned out, my thinking was right on this. Now, the story of L.W. Wright is a fascinating one. According to NASCAR lore, in April 1982, William Dunaway contacted a, a Nashville newspaper to promote L.W. Wright, who was entering his first NASCAR Cup Series race with the Winston 500 with a team called Music City Racing. At the time, it was claimed that Wright had 43 Budweiser Late Model Sportsman Series, now the NASCAR Xfinity Series, starts. Wright also announced that country artists Merle Haggard, T.G. Shepard, and Waylon Jennings were to sponsor his team. These claims, however, were later proved false. A NASCAR officials questioned his background since there was no real records to support his claims. Um, and keep in mind, this is 82. The Internet doesn't exist yet, so it's not as easy to look up a driver's information than it is now. However, right-to-work laws required NASCAR to race if he could pay his license 
and uh, fee and pay in cable card. Now the license fee at that time was one hundred dollars or three hundred and ninety. Excuse me, three hundred and two dollars and ninety five cents in today's money. Now B W Bernie Terrell, remember that name. He was the head of uh, Nashville-based Space Age Marketing. He assisted Wright with purchasing the car as well as a sponsorship. There were also a number of expenses that were helped with. I will do these expenses in both uh, 1982 and 2022 dollars. And these numbers were calculated using inflation calculators. The car in and of itself was about $30,000 or $90,866. Um, $7,500 or $22,721 to cover expenses. Uh, he paid for the car, which he bought from Sterling Waring, for, uh, according to the source that I went to, uh, he paid $20,700 or $90,866 for the cash with $17,051,502 in cash and a check for the remainder. $1,500 to $1,800 or a $4,544 to $5,453 to Goodyear for tires. $1,200 to $3,600 for parts. And $508 excuse me, 168 or 508.96 to the Southern Textile Association for racing jackets. Now, when the race weekend came, Wright did not do well. He suffered a wreck in qualifying, but was able to get the car in racing condition. He qualified 36, but when NASCAR saw that he wasn't really able to race, he was black flagged 13 laps into the race for being too slow. It should be noted that Sterling Marlin was also his crew chief, and he became suspicious when Wright was asking questions, like basic questions that every race car driver should already know. So 13 laps into the race, NASCAR black flagged him for being too slow. <coughs> Sorry. What happened next became infamous and lives on in NASCAR lore to this day. Wright returned to the garage, abandoned the car at the track, and disappeared. Now, for most of his expenses, he paid with checks, which all bounced. Team owner, team owner um, B.W. Terrell, who had assisted him in getting the car and most of his equipment, <coughs> told the press, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, Okay, as I was saying, um, B.W. Terrell, who had assisted him in getting the car and provided him with um, the money involved, said that Wright owed him over $30,000 for this whole fiasco. There were private investigations, there were legal investigations, but nobody saw L.W. Wright ever again until a few weeks ago. Uh, the Scene Vault podcast released an episode featuring an interview with a guy named Larry Wright who claims to be L.W. Wright. Um, and before I say this, before I continue, drop what you're doing, put this video on pause, and go listen to the Scene podcast where they interview L.W. Wright. It's a fascinating listen. Um, one of the... Um, one of their lost my place. Oh, they had been trying to spend a year track tracking down LW Wright and got a break in April when a mutual request bought the um, the podcaster to write, and it was apparently like a very secretive thing where they had to meet at a neutral location and then the acquaintance drove him to LW Wright's location. This led to a lengthy interview, part of which was published on May second. Now, with the NASCAR media not being as strong as it is, there was only one published photo of Wright from the event. It features Wright wearing one of your typical 1980s fire suits, 
God, those were awesome. I I liked. I didn't get to watch NASCAR in the '80s, but I want. I loved the old '80s fire suits. Now Wright has a suit identical to the um, suit in the photo, which he which he's legitimately uses proof to prove who he is. Now, by his own account, Wright was a bus driver who was working in the Nashville music industry. And it should be noted that there are some differences between his story and the sort of generally agreed upon lore. Uh, He claims that he received money from Jennings, George Jones, and Merle Haggard to help pay for his Talladega entry. It should be noted that all three of them are deceased and cannot verify this. And his version of events also include that he told Marlon he'd paid for the car after the race but didn't. He also never paid bills for tires tires from Goodyear and his NASCAR competition license. Now, I have not been able to find proof of this, but apparently there are records that show that Wright tried to qualify at the Nashville Fairgrounds Speedway the following week. And he claims, he claims, that his unpaid bills were because of a sponsor who backed out after he failed to qualify. Now, even he... Now, Wright obviously denies he ever owed Terrell $30,000, and even his kid said that even Terrell's son said that his dad didn't seem too upset about losing the $30,000 as he never really talked about it. Now, he Wright claimed that his car number, 34, was both his age at the time and a tribute to black pioneer Wendell Scott. Um, again, none of this can be verified outside of what he says. And he also went on to state that Dale Earnhardt Sr. told them, quote, when you get out there, you get on the back of someone who's been there before and you follow them, stay with them, and then make your move. Uh, current Fox Sports analyst and former NASCAR crew chief Larry McReynolds, who at the time was race, was working with Donnie Allison's team, said that Earnhardt was the type of driver who would often offer advice to rookies, though he admitted he didn't know if this conversation actually happened. When asked why he felt the need to do the interview, Wright said that he agreed to it because he is in poor health and that he claims he wants to get his side of the story out while he still can. Um, I'm going to just point out a few things. There's a few different versions of why Larry Wright did what what he did on YouTube. I would suggest going out and watching them. I really can't digest them all here because this video would simply be too long. Um, But one of the claims that was made was that Wright was was not exactly, wasn't a bus driver for the rich and famous. He was more of a petty criminal who really didn't do much and he figured out a way to con his way not only into a race but a guy out of $30,000. That, to me, seems like more of a true story than Wright's version. Because there's too many things that don't make sense about Wright's version of events. And to be sincerely honest with you, I don't doubt that Larry Wright is L.W. Wright. There's too, there's too many things that make sense about his story for this that part of the story not to be true. But I'm taking Larry's versions of events with, with a grain of salt because there's simply too much evidence disputing it. So I'm waiting for the scene vault to release other parts of the interview because I'll be fascinated to see how this plays out. But this is such a weird story, and if it, if if it it had happened in eighty two, where it was, it wasn't impossible to look up this information, but it was certainly more difficult. And it should also be known that part of the reason that he got away with it was because at especially at a track like Talladega, you'd have like three to four local guys in every race. I mean, thir- uh, ninety thousand dollars for a race car. 
I mean, come on. That's a great deal even today. You can't you can't even find like you can even find vintage race cars on eBay for reasonable prices. So in my mind, I have to hear more of this interview. Cause any any even the Scene Vault podcast has said that we're only releasing part of it. We've got other things we're working on, including this. So we're we've got more coming. I'm waiting to hear this. I want to hear more of this. This is such a weird, bonkers, out of the infield level weirdness, and it's just great. It's been, it's just amazing. Okay, so I'm gonna try to finish up some work on some racing suit stuff for next week. I can't guarantee it. I've got about, I don't know, 20 other things that I'm working on. So, I'm Dave Farson. Leave a like, comment, share, and subscribe. I'll see you next week with episode 20 of Driver Suit Blog Radio.